we are in part three of our series that we started a few weeks back called Without Any Doubt. Without any doubt, uh, what we're doing is we're doing a five-week series. We teach in series here at Cornerstone. We believe the topics that we're hitting on aren't topics that can be fully communicated or expounded on in one week. So we try to build these things out as much as we can. So we're doing this five-week series called Without Any Doubt. And what we're doing is we're studying the book of John. The, the biblical uh, book of John. Now, if you know anything about the book of John, you're probably laughing right now that we're doing a five-week study on it <laughs> because the, Bible, uh, the biblical book of John is so rich, it's so deep, it's so theologically complex, we could be studying this thing for five years, let alone uh, for, for, uh, for five weeks. So there's so much stuff here, but what we're really trying to do is like a 35,000-foot view of what the biblical book of John talks about and uh, it's, it's really interesting because John is one of the only books in Scripture, it's one of the only accounts that we have in Scripture, where the person writing it flat out tells us what their purpose is. You don't get that too often. Like, you, you don't usually get a writer straight up saying, here's why I'm writing this book. Usually it's just account after account, or it's pieces of wisdom literature or something like that. But John tells us why he's writing. I want to read this to you. The words won't be up on the screen. I, I just wanted to read this real quick. This is from John chapter 20. I want to read the Amplified Version. This is where we got our title for uh, this series. This is what it says. John writes, there are also many other signs and attesting miracles that Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written so that you may believe without any doubt that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the Son of God, and that by believing and trusting and relying on him, you would have life in his name. That's why John is writing this account of scripture. He's saying, I, I just want to write this account. I wanna record what I saw because my hope is that as you read this, you can know without any doubt who Jesus is and by knowing who he is, you can know what he can do in your life. That's what John wants us to pick up on. That's what we're gonna learn about today, finding out who Jesus is without any doubt. So last week, we kind of introduced, we jumped into who Jesus is, and we looked at how the Gospel of John talks about Jesus' deity, the fact that Jesus is God. This is something that you see all throughout John's account of, uh, of Scripture. You see story after story pointing to the fact that Jesus is God, which is a really important point to know about Jesus. It's a very foundational point to know about Jesus, that Jesus is God. But this is what I would say. That's only part of who Jesus is. If we just focus on the God part and we ignore the other parts, we're missing a huge crucial part of who Jesus is. So yes, Jesus is God. When we look at God, whenever we look at Jesus, we are seeing God, that's absolutely true. But there's more to Jesus than just that fact. That would be like trying to describe me to somebody and saying, well, Pastor Jacob, he, uh, he's a man. Cool, anything like <laughs> that it? That all you're gonna tell me about him? Or is there more to the story? Is there more to who this guy is? And so there is more, right? There, there's a whole lot more to me. If you wanna know who I am, if you wanna know me better, you need to know other roles about me. Like for example, have you, ever, have you ever seen somebody out of the only context that you knew them in and it surprised you? <laughs> like th this will help you. Like whenever you were in elementary school or middle school and you went to the grocery store with your mom and you saw your teacher and you're like, what are you, you're not allowed to be here. Why aren't you in the school? Like, what are you doing out? Like, it's, it's like seeing an animal out in the wild. Like, there's Mrs. Phillips grazing for food in the grocery aisle. Like, that's, it, it throws you for a loop because you're like, this is weird. I've never known them to be in this position. I've never known them to, to, to look like this, to, to seem like this. And seeing them in this new context, it changes the way you view them. Maybe this has happened with you. You uh, are at work and you've only known your coworkers or your boss as that, as coworkers or boss, but then you finally decide, yeah, I'll go out with you guys for dinner after work one time, and you start to get to know them, and you know their different roles, and you hear them telling stories, and you're like, okay, well, this isn't just my boss, this is a, a mom, and this is a sister, and this is a friend, and you, you hear about their hobbies, and suddenly, knowing these different roles about them, it changes the way you see them, and it changes the way you understand them. 
For me, I mean, knowing who I am changes the way you see me. Knowing the fact that I'm a, a dad, that I'm a husband, that I'm a pastor, that I'm a Browns fan, it changes the way you see me. You're gonna pray for me more. You're gonna feel sorry for me more often than you would for normal people, right? It, it changes things when we know people's roles. And what I would wanna argue today, and what I think we're gonna see as we study the book of John today is this, that when we better understand Jesus's roles, we better understand Jesus, that the more we, we dive into, okay, yes, Jesus is God, but what does that look like? What, is it, what does it look like as Jesus fulfills the different roles and the offices and the titles that he has? What does that actually mean? I mean basically, what we're gonna be doing today when we, whenever we study uh, uh, John's gospel is we're gonna be putting flesh on the, the, the skeleton of Jesus's godhood. <laughs> That's like this foundational aspect of who he is. Yes, Jesus is God, but there's so much more at play there. There, there's so much richness and complexity and, and so many roles that he fulfills. And as we study these, as we look into these roles, it's going to broaden our view and broaden and deepen our appreciation for who Jesus is and what he does in our lives. So what I want us to do today, we're gonna look at the three main roles that Jesus fulfills. Uh, and today, I'm just gonna be honest, today is a lot more Teaching than preaching, <laughs> unless I get carried away at any point. But today's a lot more teaching than preaching. So you got your Bible, you got your sermon notebook. If you are ready, why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, let's get to it. Say, let's get to it. Let's dive in to it today. If you are a sermon note taker, our title for today is Prophet, Priest, and King. Prophet, Priest, and King. As you study the Old Testament, you start in Genesis and you read all the way through Malachi, you see these three offices pop up over and over and over again. The office of prophet, the office of priest, and the office of king. These are three roles, the three main roles. You can kind of think of it how we have our branches of government in the United States. These are the three main roles that you would see pop up uh, that were to lead the nation of Israel, that were to guide the nation of Israel and instruct the nation of Israel. This is who they were turned to. And each of these offices performed very specific certain functions for each separate office. They, they, they didn't overlap. They didn't intertwine. Everybody had their own role to fulfill. And what's really cool is whenever we study and we look at these different roles, we see these, these are actual things. We have archaeological evidence of high priests who have served and of kings who have uh, ruled in Israel and uh, of prophets who have spoken. Like we have, we have evidence that these were real things, that these were real people, that these were real offices. So they were very real. But what's so cool is that they weren't just real for those people at that time but what all these offices were is they also served as a signpost, as something pointing to something that's coming. And so, yes, God installs the office of prophet for, for Moses to fulfill and for Jonah to fulfill and for Samuel to fulfill. But he's also saying, yeah, it's not just an office for here. This is a signpost pointing to one day there will be a prophet, one final perfect prophet to come. There is the office of priest, and you know, this person serves as a priest, and Melchizedek served as priest, and this person serves as priest, but one day, there is going to be a final perfect high priest. One day, there's going to be a perfect final king to come and rule. These offices, they served a function in the moment while also pointing to the eventual reality to come as Jesus would step onto the scene. And that's what's just amazing to realize is that Jesus, think about this, this is so cool. Jesus stepped into roles 2,000 plus years ago that are still affecting us today. Jesus stepped into these roles, stepped into these offices, took these responsibilities on him, and how he fulfilled them, how he completed them, it is still affecting you and I and our walk and our relationship with God to this very Day. So what we're going to do, we're going to walk through each one of these offices one at a time and study how Jesus has fulfilled them and what exactly it means for our life. So first off, let's look at Jesus as prophet. Jesus as prophet. Quick question, does anyone know who was the first prophet in Israel's history? Does anyone know? Moses. There you go. There we go. That's someone who sat in first service. <laughs> First service, it got a little quiet, and I had to tell everyone, I'll give you a hint, it rhymes with Moses. <laughs> but yes, Moses. Moses was the first uh, prophet in the history of the nation of Israel. 
Now, what's the role of a prophet? What's that look like? Basically, what a prophet was is they are a spokesperson for God. They're a spokesperson for God. God would communicate through the prophet. What God would communicate, he would communicate his will, his direction, what, what he intended for the nation, what he intended for them to do. He would communicate this through the prophet, and the prophet would teach it to the people. Another high calling of the prophet wasn't to just teach the nation what to do, but to correct them when they weren't doing it, to call them back to repentance. Repentance literally means to turn face, to turn around, to, to change direction. And so when God would communicate to a prophet, tell them this is the way to go, as that prophet would see the nation starting to veer off course, their job was to correct the nation and call them back to, hey, we gotta get back to where we're supposed to go. We gotta get back to the way that we were meant and we were designed to live. They'd communicate God's will. They would call to repentance. This is a little bit different than what we typically think of when we hear the word prophet. When, when you hear prophet or prophecy, you, you may think that, or you may think, no, like I'm thinking Nostradamus specials on the History Channel at 2 a.m. about did Nostradamus predict the Titanic sinking? Did Nostradamus predict the end of the world? Like that's where your mind goes. You hear prophecy and you think end times and devastation and calamity, and that's what you think of. But honestly, what we see prophets mostly doing isn't that. Now, of course, there is an element to this kind of uh, prediction of the future. We see that especially in the life of Jesus. All of these prophecies that we see in the Old Testament when, under the Old Covenant where uh, prophets are talking about what the coming Messiah is going to be like, where he's gonna be born, all these kind of things. That, that does happen, but usually what prophets would do, what looks like predicting the future is them just knowing what happens when you don't follow God's plan. <laughs> Like whenever, whenever you see prophets talking, honestly, what the majority of it is, is they're just saying, hey, cause and effect. Like, guys, I see that we are heading off course and I am telling you right now, God has told me if we keep going this way, this is what it's gonna be like. This is what's gonna happen when we live out the natural consequences of rebelling against his way, of going against his will. They would do this. They would, they would speak about cause and effect. And not just that, another thing that they would do, and this is a big thing, is uh, that they would expound on the law. Now, God gave the law through the original prophet, through Moses, the, the first prophet. He gave his law through Moses. And then prophets that would come, they would expound on the law. They would teach on the law. They would give you fuller clarity and context regarding the law. And this is how things went for literal thousands of years. It starts with Moses, and then there's new ones, and then Samuel comes, and then, you know, Micah, and, and Jeremiah, and Isaiah, and all these, these prophets come, they keep doing the same thing. They're a spokesman, they talk for God, they communicate his will, tell people where to go. If they don't go that way, call them back to repentance. This is what's happening over and over and over until we get to a man by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, who was also a prophet. John the Baptist comes on the scene. John the Baptist, by the way, not the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. These are two separate people. But John the Baptist comes on the scene. He's a prophet. He starts ministering, and he starts making waves. People are hearing about him, hearing what he's up to, what he's teaching, what he's preaching. And different religious leaders are curious. They want to know, what's this guy talking about? What's going on? Who is he? So that's where I want us to pick up today. We're going to be in John chapter 1, and we're going to be jumping all over the book of John. So if you've got a Bible, uh, just be prepped. We're going to be hopping all over the book of John today. But I want us to begin in John chapter 1, starting in verse 19. This is what it says in the New Living Translation. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, who are you? Right, they wanna know, who, who is this guy? You are wildly different than what we've seen recently. You're, you're a prophet, but you're a different prophet, prophet than what we're used to, so who are you? John came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. John's like, I already know where you're going this. I can follow your train of thought. You wanna know if I'm the Messiah, that's not who I am. Verse 21, well then, who are you, they asked. Are you Elijah? Now they're wondering, okay, if you're not, you're not the Messiah, are you Elijah, one of the other greatest prophets who ever lived? Are you him, like reincarnated? What, what's going on here? No, he replied. Are you the prophet we are expecting? Once again, John says no. Then who are you? We need an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness, clear the way for the Lord's coming. 
Now you see, in those round of questions that John had lobbied towards him, the one question that they ask is, are you the prophet that we are expecting? This is not some random prophet that they're talking about. They're talking about a very specific prophet, one who was to come, one who they were waiting for and looking for. This belief of this one prophet actually comes from the book of Deuteronomy. This is, we're jumping now again from John the Baptist, the most recent prophet on the scene, all the way back to Moses, the original prophet on the scene. In the book of Deuteronomy, this is what it says in chapter 18. Moses is talking. He says this, Moses has continued, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you yourselves requested of the Lord your God when you were assembled at Mount Sinai. You said, don't let us hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore or see this blazing fire for we will die. So God's saying, yeah, I'll raise up a prophet to speak for me because you guys yourself have said, we don't want to hear from you. <laughs> like you, you, will, you, you, you scare us. Please have someone mediate and speak on your behalf. And so it says, the Lord said to me, what they said is right. I will raise up a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell the people everything I command him. This idea that starts back here in the, Deuteron in, uh, the book of Deuteronomy is one that the nation of Israel had looked forward to for millennia. The idea that one of these days there will be a prophet coming who won't be like the rest. He's gonna be different. He's gonna be the final prophet, one who truly comes, uh, a prophet who is not a spokesman for God, a prophet who is God speaking for himself. That one of these days, someone is going to step into our situation and they are going to be completely different than anything we've encountered so far. Not just a prophet who, who communicates God's will, even though they're imperfect. Because can I tell you something about Moses? He was imperfect. You read about his life. He, he was the greatest prophet in uh, Israel's history, him and Elijah. But you look at their life and you see the times that they messed up, that they screwed up, that they sinned, that they didn't live exactly the way that they were supposed to. These were imperfect and flawed men. But Israel knew and they were hoping for and they were believing for that one of these days, a perfect prophet would come. Somebody who wouldn't imperfectly communicate God's will, but would perfectly live it out. Not saying, hey, look, I know I screwed up, but this is what God wants us to do, but someone who would say, no, I'm gonna live this thing out. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you what to do. I'm gonna show you what to do. I'm gonna live out what to do. I'm going to perfectly live and encapsulate the will of God in my life so you can look at me and see what it's supposed to look like. Israel believed that one day a prophet was coming who wouldn't just call the people to repentance, even though he needs repentance himself, <laughs> That a prophet was coming who wouldn't just call to repentance, but who would be able to offer repentance and offer forgiveness himself. They believed this prophet, that this person was coming one of these days. A prophet who wouldn't just continue to expound on the law, to walk people through the law and explain what it means, or, or to even give new laws, but know that one day a prophet is coming who's going to fulfill and complete the law perfectly. That one of these days, this person is coming, and that's exactly who Jesus is. That's exactly who Jesus was. Jesus is a perfect prophet who calls us out of the darkness to live how we were truly meant to live. Jesus is the prophet. Not only that, Jesus is priest. Jesus is prophet and Jesus is priest. What a priest was, let's talk about this. A priest, what their role was, if you were to sum it up in one word, it's an intercessor. A priest was an intercessor. Someone to literally bridge the gap between the people and their God. That was the role of a priest, to intercede on behalf of the people before God. They would receive offerings, receive sacrifices from the people, and then present them to God. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, like, why? <laughs> why did God make it that way? Like, why did God have to have a priest do this? That seems kind of silly. Why did there ever need to be a middleman standing between us and God. A lot of us can find problems with that and feel like, well, that's not how it should be. That, that doesn't seem right that there's someone needed between me and God. Um, let me try to explain it to you a little bit. This isn't gonna be a perfect analogy, but it's the best one I could come up with, and I came up with it uh, about 11 o'clock last night. So we'll see how well it works, all right? Did anyone watch the Guardians game last night? Or should I say fight night in downtown Cleveland? Did anyone get to 
See, if you missed it, go on YouTube. You don't want to miss it. It was something else. So last night, we're playing the Chicago White Sox, down five to nothing. Just hasn't been a good game. We finally start to get a little bit of a spark. Our third baseman, Jose Ramirez, he's the best player for the Guardians. He uh, uh, hits a double, right? H hits a, a great hit. He starts to stretch it into a double. So he comes around first. He's running as hard as he can. Slides into second. He's safe. The guy who plays second base for the Chicago White Sox, he's kind of a notorious troublemaker. Like this guy is known around the league. His name is Tim Anderson. This guy is known around the league for just being a problem. Like he, he talks a lot of smack. He's like really aggressive. He like keeps plays going even after they're over. And he had been doing this in the previous game against the Guardians too, the night before, just kind of pushing people's buttons and stuff. So Jose slides into second base. Tim Anderson tries to tag him, misses him. And Jose, as he's trying to stand up, uh, Tim Anderson like won't back up to kind of let him stand up. He just kind of stays standing over top of him like this. And so Jose kind of like pushes him out of the way and stands up. And as he does, you can see Jose point in his face and say something that I probably shouldn't repeat from the stage, and I won't repeat from the stage. So he says something to Tim Anderson. Tim Anderson, you see him go like this, says something back to him, chucks his mitt, and then squares up. Like, normally whenever I'm talking about like fights and sports, you, you've seen them, they're not fights, it's a pushing match. It's just, hey, 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 like, whoa, we'll just push each other and feel, feel really tough even though nothing's going on, we'll just push each other. This was a fight, even the, the, the ump, it, it, looked, it looked like a boxing match breaking out because the ump jumped in between the two of them to kind of break it up. And then you can, I'm not kidding, go and look at the video. It's actually kind of hilarious. The ump looks at Tim Anderson's face, looks at Jose Ramirez's face, and then just goes, like this, his backside. He's like, I'm not catching a stray. Like, I'm, nope, go at it, boys. So he backs up, and Tim Anderson throws like two or three haymakers just right at Jose Ramirez before everybody can come in, and he's kind of backing up. He throws one, misses Jose Ramirez, but his second one, he throws a right hook, and it connected. He sent Tim Anderson into next Tuesday. Like, he just <laughs> dropped him to the ground. The bench is clear. The stadium is just erupting. They're like, yeah! They're like, this is the greatest thing. It's utter insanity, right? And the thing that made it so crazy is this is not Jose Ramirez. If you're just a casual baseball fan, you may not know this. Jose Ramirez is one of the most mild-mannered people in baseball. Like, he, he's like everyone, he's the jokester on the team. Everyone uh, finds him to just be a kind, nice guy. Uh, uh, he's never, he's played baseball for almost a decade now in the pros. He's never been ejected once, ever. He doesn't complain about calls, anything like this. So people are like, what in the, like, everyone, and myself included, was dying for the game to end. I didn't even care if we won or lost at that point. I just wanted the game to get over so I could hear an explanation of like, what happened? <laughs> like, what, what was he saying? What was he doing? Like, what did you guys say to each other? And so after the game's over, the whole city of Cleveland is like on the edge of their seats waiting to hear Jose Ramirez talk after the game. Here's the problem though. Jose Ramirez is from the Dominican Republic. He does not speak English well at all. <laughs> Like, he can speak English well if he's got, like, time to prepare and it's prepared statements and stuff like that where he can borderline memorize what he needs to say. But off-the-cuff answers, it's just, it's not happening. And so for the whole city of Cleveland, for all Guardians fans and White Sox fans and the sports world, like, this thing blew up last night. Everyone who wants to know is waiting on bated breath. But unless you can speak Hispanic, unless you're, you're able to, to speak Spanish, you, you don't know what Jose is saying. Like, you just have no idea except for the fact that Jose has an interpreter. <laughs> and so as they're standing there at, the, the, at his locker, the, the journalists, everyone's mics are just <laughs> like out, like we want to hear. And so they're asking questions like, Jose, what in the world happened? What did he say? How did it get to this point? You're so nice. I, like, I've never seen anything like this. What, what were you thinking? All these questions were being not directed at Jose. They're being directed at the interpreter. Like what, they're saying all this different stuff. The interpreter hears it and goes, okay, and turns towards Jose and starts communicating to Jose in the language he can understand. Because this interpreter has his feet in two realities at once. They can speak Spanish and they can speak English. So they're able to bridge the divide. They're able to bridge the gap. The high priest that we read about in scripture is someone who has their feet in two separate realities, in the earthly realities and the heavenly realities. They are able 
to bridge the gap. The, the high priest that we would read about that would be presenting the offerings, like, like Aaron in, in, in the Old Testament, we read about Aaron. This is someone who is fluent in the holy languages. <laughs> This is someone who is able to take the offerings of people, people who are coming saying, hey, I'm repenting of my sin, I'm turning from my ways, here is my offering, here is my sacrifice. They're able to take that and then convert it and and offer it before God in a way that is holy and pleasing and acceptable to God. They're able to bridge that gap, they're able to bridge that divide and we need that. (laughs) They didn't just need it back then. We need an intercessor today. But let me tell you, Israel did need it. Because if you read the accounts of Israel's history, you see over and over and over again, they had a lot they needed to reconcile for. (laughs) Anyone know anything about that, right? They had a lot that they had. They had a lot of things they needed to sacrifice for. They had a lot of things that they needed to seek out God's forgiveness for. They needed this priest, someone who was fluent in the holy languages to bridge the divide between them and God which is why things are so startling when Jesus walks on the scene because when he walks on the scene, everything changes. Who knows that's true? When Jesus walks into the scene, everything changes. Jesus, Jesus walks in the scene and suddenly we start seeing things and hearing things from him that make you, if, if you don't walk into the story of scripture with, with just already being saturated and knowing how the story is gonna go, it's mind-blowing stuff that we read about the way that Jesus acts, the the kind of way that he teaches, the things that he does. I want us to look at John chapter eight, verse nine and 11, or nine through 11. Uh, What we're about to see here is something that plays out in all of the scripture or all of the uh, gospel accounts. We see it over and over and over again, but this is a specific one I want us to look at uh, today. So this is John chapter eight, verses nine through 11. Jesus, this is the famous story. There's a woman who's been caught in adultery, brought before Jesus, uh, the People tell him, hey, this is what scripture says. This woman should be stoned to death because of what she's done. What do you say? Jesus tells him, if you're without sin, cast the first stone. And this is where we pick up in verse nine. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. With that statement, neither do I. What Jesus is doing, and again, we see this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and all over the book of John. What Jesus is doing in this moment is he is forgiving sin. You don't forgive sin. (laughs) In fact, the high priest doesn't even forgive sin on his own. He's just mediating your sacrifice and your offering to God, that's, that's all that's happening here. So this stranger steps onto the scene and suddenly seems to have the authority to claim that he can forgive sin. And what's even wilder isn't just that he thinks he can have authority to give sin. The people who he's forgiving don't even have a sacrifice to present. Read it, read the scriptures for yourself. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll see time and time again, Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. And you'll see what's noticeably absent is a sacrifice. <laughs> Like how, where do you get off? See, it's so funny. We, we so quickly jump to condemn the Pharisees and religious leaders in scripture. Like, oh, they're just awful, aren't they? They're the worst, these terrible people. Man, if you were there back then, you'd be a Pharisee too. So would I. Like, we, that's where we would be because that's all you knew up to this point is, well, hold up. This isn't how things go. <laughs> like, we know how things go. We know how things have worked for every high priest that's ever been. We know how he did it. We know how his daddy did it. We know how his daddy daddy did it. Like we, we can trace this thing back. We know how this works, and this isn't it. You don't even have a sacrifice to present. How in the world can you step into this role of intercessor? How in the world can you step into this role of priest? And the reason Jesus could do that, the reason it was different with him is because Jesus knew something no one else around him knew at this time. What Jesus knew is these people don't need a sacrifice because I'm the sacrifice. (laughs) It's me. (laughs) They they don't need to offer anything because I'm going to offer everything on their behalf. I'm going to step in to the gap. I'm gonna bridge in a way that nobody could bridge the, the earthly reality and the heavenly reality. I'm going to intercede for these people on their behalf. Jesus is the sacrifice. He is the willing 
sacrifice. This is one of my favorite, I, I had never noticed this until this week whenever I was studying this piece of scripture. Listen to how this reads in John chapter 18. This is Jesus just had his final supper with his disciples. He's getting ready to be betrayed. He's getting ready to be arrested. This is what it says, starting in verse one. After saying these things, Jesus crossed the Kidron Valley with his disciples and entered a grove of olive trees. Judas the betrayer was there because Jesus had often gone to this place with his disciples. The leading priests and the Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany them. Now listen to this. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons, they arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. So he stepped forward to meet them. <laughs> he, he knew, he, I, he knew, he, he was the prophet, right? Jesus is the, the final perfect prophet. He knew where this story ends. He knew the prophecies about himself. He knew better than anybody else. Nobody else saw it ending this way. Everybody else saw power and glory and a throne and we're in charge and the Romans are out of here. That's what they saw at the end of the road. Jesus was the only person who saw the cross at the end. He was the only person who knew what was coming and he willingly, in the midst of this, seeing what's about to happen, didn't turn and run. He stepped forward to meet them because he is a willing sacrifice. He's not just the high priest who mediates our sacrifices. He is the sacrifice that he has offered up himself. Jesus is a perfect priest, not handling our sacrifice, but handing himself over a sacrifice. He alone is worthy, and what that means, you, you might be hearing all this stuff today, and you're going, yeah, this is interesting, like this is interesting, but what does it do for me to know that Jesus is prophet, priest, and king? Like what, what does it actually mean for you? It means everything for you. You want to know what it means? It sounds very intellectual. Oh, Jesus is the priest, and that's cool to know. You know how this matters to you? Because you don't need an earthly mediator anymore. You don't need to come to me or Pastor Brenda or Pastor Donnie to be like, I got to get something off my chest. I got to tell you guys for me to be okay with God. I got to come to you for me to be okay with God. You don't have to have an earthly mediator anymore because you have a perfect, better, heavenly one. Like, think, think about this. The, the whole point is that the people could not go into God's presence. You just couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. The, the priest alone is the only person with a foot in both realities. And so you come to the priest, and the priest takes your offerings, and, and basically you're just sitting outside the boardroom hoping things are going well. Like, put in a good word for me in there. Like, let him know I really love him. Let him know that truly is the best sacrifice I could do. Like, put... All right, bye. And then he goes into the Holy of Holies and you're just, that's it, you're done. That's the closest encounter you get with God. But what we see in Jesus is that the veil that separated God's presence from his people was torn from top to bottom. There is no separation anymore. And our mediator isn't standing between us. He walks with us to the throne of the Father. So whenever we're praying, whenever we're approaching God, we're, we're not approaching hoping somebody else puts in a good word for us. We're boldly stepping up to the throne as children of God with Jesus right there at our side. That's what it means for you that Jesus is a perfect priest handing himself over as our sacrifice. He is our mediator. Jesus is our prophet. Jesus is our priest. And finally, Jesus is our king. Jesus is our king. Now, the role of the king, the main thing that the king would do uh, was basically defend the nation, defend the nation from foreign invaders, make sure that nobody would break in and destroy the nation or try to subdue the nation. Uh, they, it's a lot like our executive branch today. Their, their job, the king does not make the rules. That's not how it's supposed to be, at least, right? The king is not supposed to make the rules. That happens through the prophets speaking on God's behalf. The king's job is I just execute it. I execute the rules, I make sure that we, we are living the right way, and I will defend and I will protect this nation. That is the role of the king. Now the funny thing is, this is the only role that isn't supposed to exist. <laughs> like prophet and priest, those, those were set in place at Sinai. Like those were set in place early on when God gave the law. The king wasn't supposed to be a thing. Like it just wasn't. God told his people, you don't need a king, I'm your king. I'm your king. You, you don't need a, a human person for this. This is, this is something that's a sermon for another day too. This is such a perfect 
view of the accommodation of God that we see whenever God uh, talks about uh, kings here, which this, this is a, it's a tricky subject for a lot of people, hearing about this principle of accommodation that's in scripture because we can just think, well, that can't be. There's no way God accommodates sin and there's no way God stoops down to our level. It's all over the pages of scripture. Chances are, if you feel that way, you're feeling that way more because of what you've been taught or what tradition told you or what your denominational background told you. I'm telling you right now, accommodation is all over the pages of scripture. Let me prove it to you with this. So God's original intent, he told his people, this is a command, I am your king, no earthly king, it's me. And at the time, God had just led his people out of, out of Egypt and might and power, and so people were like, yeah, absolutely, we don't want a king, we just want you, that's all we want, we just, we just want you, God, you be our king. They said that at the moment, but then guess what happened? <laughs> time goes on. And suddenly those same people start noticing all these cultures around them, the Philistines, the Canaanites, all these people, the Jebusites, they see, see all these people, they're like, well, they have earthly kings. Looks kind of cool how they do things. It would be nice to see somebody, <laughs> like to see a, a physical presence. And so they rebel against God and they reject God's command and say, we want a physical king. We want a person. We want a king. Now, guess what God had, did, had done? This is, this is just incredible. Back in the book of Deuteronomy, back whenever God's people are still high off of getting out of Egypt, like, woo, God's powerful, God's mighty, this is incredible, this is amazing. Back at that moment when they said, no king but you, no king but God, you know what God did? He put instructions in the law of how to choose, how to guide requirements, standards, all this for a king. Think about that. God commanded, no king but me, and then instantly says, and I know you're gonna rebel. I know you're gonna turn your back on me. I know you're riding off the spiritual high right now. I know with everything seems awesome right now, but I know you're gonna turn your back on me. And rather than me saying, and because you've sinned, you're cut off. Until you turn back and you say, no king but God, until you do that, you're cut off from me because you're living in sin, you're, you're cut off in that moment. No, what I'm gonna do, I'm going to accommodate and I'm gonna stoop down to your level. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you guidelines and best practices and stuff that if this is what you choose, this is how to do it best because I'm telling you, I want you to have a fulfilling future, as fulfilling as it can be. So I'm gonna give you guidelines of what the king needs to do. So God sets this up in place. He, he accommodates down to the level of his people. And sure enough, God's right. His people sin, they rebel, they want an earthly king, and so God gives them their wish. Gives them a king exactly like what they would want. King Saul. King Saul, if there was a laboratory where you make a king, what you think a king is gonna look like, Saul is it. He's the standard, he's the mold. He's tall, he's charismatic, he's good looking, he's handsome, he's strong, he's all of the things that you want a king to be, except he's not a man after God's own heart. And so sure enough, he turns to ruin, he dies in battle, and God selects a new king, one who would be after his heart. A man by the name of David. David didn't live it out perfectly. He didn't follow God perfectly, but at his core, at his uh, main desire, was to be a man after God's own heart. And because of that, God promised him, David, I'm telling you right now, your line, your lineage, it's not gonna end. <laughs> and what David probably is thinking is, oh, wow, that's amazing. Like, I'm just gonna have king after king after king. And God's saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, there will be kings, but one day, there's gonna be one final perfect king. And he's not gonna be king over this small little geographic plot of land in the Middle East that I'm giving to you. No, he's going to be king and lord over all of creation. He's gonna be king and lord over everything you could possibly imagine. But this is what I wanna tell you, David, and God reiterated this through his prophets over and over He's gonna be king, but he's not gonna look like king. You're not gonna recognize him. Everything, literally everything about his kingdom is gonna be antithetical to what you think it should be. There's not one thing he's going to do that you're gonna say, yep, that's how it should be. You are going to miss it because he is going to look so different than what you expect. And sure enough, Jesus steps onto the scene and everything is different. Everything he does is antithetical to how power structures had always worked up. That We live in a time where we are so, we're, we just take for granted how much our world has been influenced by Jesus. 
everything that we value today, mercy and grace and humility, integrity, all of these things, they were not held in esteem until Jesus. They just weren't. You were mocked and ridiculed for humility. You were mocked for not seeking power. You were weak. You were killed if you weren't trying to seek power. Like, that's, that's how it was for rulers of this day. Generally speaking, how a ruler became a ruler was killing the person before him. That's what it looked like until Jesus walks on the scene and he is so completely and utterly different than anything the world had ever seen before that we just couldn't grasp it. In fact, listen to this. This is Jesus talking with Pilate, Pontius Pilate. He's a, a governor. He's a, a a Roman officer who's in charge of this area and he's presiding over Jesus's uh, uh, judgment. And this is where we wanna pick up in the conversation. I wanna look at John 18, verse 33. It says this, then Pilate went back into his headquarters and asked for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. Jesus replied, is this your own question or did others tell you this uh, about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate retorted, your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. What Jesus is talking about here is Jesus was not the first person to come on the scene claiming to be the Messiah, and he wasn't the last. If you read history, you see there were numerous Jewish revolts where people claiming to be something stepped forward, rallied some followers to them, and what they did is when their leader was threatened, they fought to the death. That's how it worked. That's what it looked like, the power structures and the, the way that power was seized and grabbed in those days. And Jesus is saying, it's totally different with my followers. If, they were, if my kingdom was of this world, they'd be fighting to protect me, but that's not happening. My kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king. Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. Jesus is saying, hey, Pilate, I get it. (laughs) You don't recognize me or my kingdom because it looks so wildly different. I am not the king that you expected. I'm not the king that you are. We're gonna talk more on that next week, this idea of the kingdom that Jesus instituted and what it looks like. But as we close out today, I just want us to hit on this thought. A typical king in Jesus' time and in the times before that, in, in ancient biblical times, what a king would look like can best be described in one word, unapproachable. Set apart. You don't talk to him. You don't look at him. You don't come see him unless he calls for you. That's what it looked like. Look at how kings lived back in. Uh, The palace usually set aside from the rest of the city, high walls, many rooms, lots of security, lots of customs and traditions and decorum and court etiquette, all to prevent you from getting in to see the king. And once you do, you better do things exactly right. You better toe the line. In fact, we hear about some of this court etiquette in the biblical book of Esther, where Esther's talking about the Persian king and the Persian court etiquette, where if you present yourself before the king and the king does not summon you, at that moment, if he gives you the thumbs down, his assistance can kill you in that instant because you weren't wanted. He didn't appreciate the way you came into his presence. Completely and utterly unapproachable. What what we see in Jesus, and I feel like this is why Pilate was so confused as he looks at this guy claiming to be the king of the Jews and he's not set apart from his followers. He's not in some high uh, building at the top of the city. He's mingling in the mix of commoners, of prostitutes, of tax collectors, of lepers in their midst. (laughs) Pilate looks at that and goes, you're a king? (laughs) What kind of king are you? He's the perfect king. Jesus is a perfect king, one who welcomes everyone into fellowship at his table. Not even just fellowship to come follow me, but I want you at my table. I don't want you to just follow me. I want to commune with you. I want to dine with you. I want to fellowship with you. I want to call you friend. That's the kind of king that we have in Jesus. Church, are we happy that we have that kind of king? Are we happy that we have that kind of priest, that kind of prophet? Because that's exactly who Jesus 
is, one who's not unapproachable or distant, but one who is close and who is intimate and calls us into intimate relationship with himself. When we get this, when we understand the roles of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king, not just as God, which is incredible enough on its own, but we understand who he truly is, I'm telling you, it changes everything about the way that you relate to him. You marinate on this, you you read the book of John and you look for these things to pop up. Jesus as priest calling you gently back into the way that God designed you to live. Jesus as priest forgiving sins for you, interceding on your behalf. And Jesus as king calling you to not just follow him but to commune with him. It will change your relationship with God forever. 